History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Haunted True Crime. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 341st episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. Hey, Kelly. On this episode, we're going to do a haunted true crime. Love it. And it's about one of my favorite architects, Frank Lloyd Wright. Not many people know that he is connected to a mass murder, which has led to some hauntings. Looking forward to hearing more. And this is connected to his home in Wisconsin, Taliesin. But before we get into that, we want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew, Jim. Mystique, how is that for a name? Very cool. Mags, Kathy with a K, Carrie with a C, and Lisa. Welcome to the crew, everybody. And now, this moment, Noddity. The moment in oddity was suggested by John Michaels. During World War II, a Royal Air Force anti-aircraft unit was stationed in Belgium and had a really weird experience. They watched as a B-17 appeared in the air over them, with its landing gear down and slowly descending, ending its flight with a crash into a nearby field. The unit was perplexed. They had not been advised that a plane would be coming in for a landing. The fact that it crashed was even more perplexing. The group rushed over to offer assistance. Major John V. Crisp reported what they had found after opening the hatch. We now made a thorough search, and our most remarkable find in the fuselage was about a dozen parachutes neatly wrapped and ready for clipping on. This made the whereabouts of the crew even more mysterious. The Sperry bombsite remained in the Perspex nose, quite undamaged, with its cover neatly folded beside it. Back on the navigator's desk was the codebook giving the colors and the letters of the day for identification purposes. Various fur-lined flying jackets lay in the fuselage together with a few bars of chocolate, partly consumed in some cases. There was absolutely no crew aboard. The B-17 had no other damage than what occurred during the crash. Clearly, the crew had not bailed out using parachutes since they were still on the plane. So where was the crew? Apparently, they were in Belgium. They claimed that enemy fire had damaged the bomb rack and taken out the engine, so they bailed. Only, the damage that they described had not happened. People started calling the B-17 the Phantom Fortress, and no real answers were ever given. There were many theories, but nothing plausible, leaving this as one of the biggest mysteries of World War II. And that certainly is odd. Grab your slippers, hot chocolate, flashlight, and maybe even that baseball bat. And now, this month in history. In the month of June, on the 13th in 1611, Johannes Fabesius published the first work on sunspots. Fabesius was a German medical student when he decided he would rather look at the stars like his father, who was a well-known astronomer. He took several telescopes with him when he went to visit his father in Ostiel. It would be here that he would see the black spots on the sun. Johannes wasn't the first to see the sunspots. The Chinese had done that before, and an Englishman had recorded them in 1610. But Johannes was the first to publish a scientific treatise on the sunspots. Further studies would prove that the sun rotated and that sunspots have an 11-year cycle. Frank Lloyd Wright is one of the most celebrated architects in America. His designs were ahead of their time, and he was a true architectural visionary. Wright's ultimate design and build would be his 37,000-square-foot home in Wisconsin that he named Taliesin. This would be the scene of what is considered the worst mass murder in Wisconsin's history. 
Most people know the successes, but not many know this dark spot in Wright's life and the event that has left one of his homes possibly haunted. Join us as we share the details of Wright's life, this tragic event, and the haunts that are connected to this famous architect. Frank Lloyd Wright was born Franklin Lincoln Wright in Wisconsin in 1867, and that Lincoln is actually for Abraham Lincoln. In 1876, Wright's mother, Anna, would make a purchase that would forever mold his future. Anna bought a set of blocks created by Friedrich Wilhelm August Frobel, and I'm sure I said that wrong, when she visited the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. The blocks were called Frobel Gifts, and they were geometrically shaped and could be assembled in various combinations to form three-dimensional compositions. Anybody who knows about Frank Lloyd Wright and the way that he designed things, you could totally see how these little building blocks made such a difference. Absolutely. Did you have blocks when you were a kid? Of course. And they were probably the ones that had numbers and letters on them. Yes. And, you know, I had some that were different shapes that had different colors on them, too. Yeah, and they were just plain wood. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. Honey, I think just about everybody's had those. But what happened? (laughs) We didn't become great architects. No, maybe not, but... (laughs) (laughs) We're both creative. (laughs) So try to buy blocks for your kids and maybe they'll become great architects someday. What is Minecraft? Is that like building blocks and stuff? I've never played it. Yeah, similar. It's it's a lot more, I wouldn't say cubism, but it's done a lot more with square shapes. Wouldn't it be interesting if we had a great architect born in the future and they go, I started with Minecraft. Minecraft. Oh, I mean, and it might be different now, but my son, my youngest, used to do Minecraft like crazy when he was younger. And he actually made some of the characters. You know the rubber band bracelets? Yeah. He would make some of the characters from Minecraft watching YouTube videos, and he would make them out of those colored rubber bands. He made me a pig. He made me a creeper guy. It was was crazy. Very cool. (laughs) Wright loved those blocks and would spend hours playing with them. They had such an effect on him that he wrote in his autobiography... For several years, I sat at the little kindergarten tabletop and played with the cube, the sphere, and the triangle. Those smooth wooden maple blocks all are in my fingers to this day. I thought that was very cool. Yeah, definitely. The family moved from their small farming community to Madison in 1877, and Wright began spending summers at his uncle's home, which was in a rural area that provided Wright the opportunity to gain a real love for nature. And that would be key in his future designs. His architecture would be referred to as organic architecture or prairie home style, something like that. When Wright was 14, his mother asked his father to leave, and after the divorce was final, Wright never saw his father again. He took on the responsibility of financially supporting the family. He also changed his middle name to Lloyd to honor his mother. Wright attended the University of Wisconsin in Madison, but did not graduate. He was bored with school and moved to Chicago to find employment, which he did with an architectural firm that gave him the position of draftsman. Wright would move on to another firm, Adler & Sullivan, where his architectural skills would blossom. He considered Louis Sullivan to be his teacher, and he had great respect for the man, although he did not like his management methods. He also didn't like his fellow draftsmen, and fistfights were a regular occurrence, not something one would usually expect inside an architectural firm. Yeah, you just envision all these guys sitting at their drafting tables and using Suddenly their duking it out <laughs> pencils and rulers, and all of a sudden they're like beating the crud out of each other. Apparently. Guess they didn't like each other's designs. No, I wanted the kitchen over there. No, it's going to be over here. Okay, let's fight it out. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave a left hook to the draw. <laughs> and gives a whole different description to Fight Club. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> On June 1st, 1889, Wright married Catherine Lee Kitty Tobin. Wright had expensive taste, and his funds were always low for that reason. So he decided to start a little side hustle. This enterprise would be designing several private homes that he affectionately dubbed bootleg houses. Hmm. Gotta love that name. Because his contract with Adler and Sullivan forbade any side work. Bootleg booze, bootleg houses. That makes sense. I was beginning to wonder if he had like hidden chambers within the bootleg houses. Yeah. (laughs) They mixing something in the bathtubs in there? Exactly. When Louis Sullivan passed by a newly built home near his townhouse, he recognized Wright's style. And Wright found himself getting the boot from the firm. The two men would not speak for 12 years. Wright decided this would be a good time to strike out on his own, and he worked out of a couple of office buildings before finally moving his practice into his home. The space was pretty cramped as Kitty and Wright had six children, so he added a studio onto the house. 
Of course, we all know one of those children will end up being Frank Lloyd Wright Jr., who becomes a really good architect himself. Wright designed both buildings and homes, but his preference was the family home. His fame was growing and his designs were in demand. He was well on his way to becoming the most famous American architect in the world, and he was changing the way Americans looked at architecture. Wright believed that design should be creative and geometric shapes would jut out of his buildings and the light of nature would flood the interiors. In his time, he designed 1,114 buildings and saw 532 of them built. And while he seemed like a god in the world of architecture, Wright was a man and men have flaws. Wright's main flaw was his desire for women other than his wife. He was not what one would describe as a family man, and he wanted to leave Kitty. The opportunity would come when he decided to design a home for his neighbor, Edwin Cheney. The project began in 1903, and through this, he got to know Cheney's wife better. Her name was Martha, but she went by Mayma, and she was a highly intellectual woman and a strong feminist. Wright was immediately enamored by her and considered her his equal in intellect. Mayma had similar feelings, and the two fell in love, despite the fact that they both were married to other people. This was not Wright's first dalliance outside his marriage, and Kitty assumed that this woman would fall by the wayside like all the others. That did not happen. Wright asked Kitty for a divorce, but she would not grant him one. Mayma left for Europe, and after two years, was able to get a divorce from her husband on the grounds of desertion. I guess that's one way to do it. You just, you desert him. I suppose so. (laughs) By 1909, both Wright and Mayma were living in Europe, where Wright hoped he could get away from home design and into bigger projects. In 1910, he had his mother buy him property in Spring Green, Wisconsin, and he built his dream home on it and named it Taliesin. Taliesin was the name of a poet and magician in Welsh mythology. The story was about an artist's struggle for identity, so I'm assuming that he chose that name specifically for that reason. It looks like he may have been at a point in his life here where he was struggling to figure out his identity. He had loved home design, but he wanted to start doing bigger buildings, hotels, things like that. Sure. Obviously, he was in between marriages here, so I think he just was kind of feeling he was in the middle of a lot of stuff. Just here in 2019, I think it was in July, so about a year ago, a group of eight buildings designed by Wright were designated as World Heritage Sites. So these aren't just National Historic Sites. They're World Heritage Sites with UNESCO. And this is along the lines of Stonehenge, the Grand Canyon, and the Great Pyramids. Taliesin is one of those eight. Very cool. This has been described as Wright's autobiography in wood and stone. This site features the Midway Barn, Hillside School, the Romeo and Juliet Windmill, Tanny Dairy, and the Frank Lloyd Wright Visitor Center. Construction on the home was completed in 1911 and followed the prairie design or organic design and was low and snug like the land on which it sat. This would be the first of three versions of Taliesin and would have two broad portions connected by a narrow loggia that covered 12,000 square feet. One side was his studio and the other was the living quarters. Local yellow limestone was used and laid to write specific directions as long, thin ledges. This gave the home a golden hue. Shingles were colored to match the trees, and every room had windows that would allow lots of sun all day long. The grounds had lots of fruit trees and berry bushes. There is a tea circle in the middle of the courtyard inspired by Japanese wabi-sabi landscaping that is rough cut from limestone with a curved stone bench, and there's a pool in the center. So for people who don't know what wabi-sabi is, I hope we're saying that right, it's basically imperfect design. It's creating a perfectly imperfect garden, kind of like what you and I are doing in our backyard right now. I see. It's uh, got different aesthetics that include asymmetry, simplicity, modesty. If you have some mistakes like, oh, we put the rock in the wrong place, or you're built, let's say you're building a stone wall and it's not exactly level, that's wabi-sabi. Uh, it has a lot of Buddhist philosophy involved with it and that kind of thing. Makes me want sushi with wasabi. Okay. Well, I'm sure you could have that in the tea garden, too, if you'd like. Mayma was an angry and mean woman and treated people according to where she thought their station in life was, meaning that if you were the help in her home, you were treated as the help. And if she decided that she no longer wanted a servant working for her, she just fired him or her with no cause or reason. Mayma moved into Taliesin and her children visited her there often. Society did not approve of the living arrangement since Wright and Mayma were not married. She's, of course, divorced at this point, but he's not. And the press denounced Wright and Mayma in editorials, and a lot of his popularity started to go downhill because of this. He was getting less commissions. In 1914, Julian and Gertrude Carlton of Barbados were hired to work at Taliesin. One of Wright's friends had recommended the couple. Gertrude took on the cook responsibilities, and Julian worked as a butler and handyman. 
Julian had a temper, and so this set him at odds with the similarly tempered Maymaw. He also did not get along with the draftsman who worked at the home named Emile Brodel. The two openly fought. Julian took to sleeping with an axe next to his bed, and this worried Gertrude. She noticed that he started acting very strangely. After a few weeks, Mayma asked the couple to leave, meaning they were fired. She gave no reason. But it is believed that Wright and Mayma had seen Julian Carlton sitting up at night holding a butcher knife, and they may have even experienced some of his paranoia. So it seems that maybe he's kind of slipping into a little bit of mental health issues here, maybe. On August 15, 1914, Wright was away on business in Chicago. Mayma had her children visiting at Taliesin. At lunchtime, she sat down with her children on the screened-in porch to have lunch. Wright's employees, who worked at the home, sat down at the dining table in the adjoining room. Julian and his wife had not left yet, but he told Gertrude to go somewhere else. He then went around and locked all the doors and windows except one. He poured gasoline all around, making sure it slipped under the door to the dining room. One survivor later said that he noticed something flowing under the screen door from the court. We thought it was nothing but soap suds spilled outside. The liquid ran under my chair, and I noticed the odor of gasoline. Julian set fire to one wing of the home, and then grabbed an axe and entered the screened-in porch. He killed Mayma and her son right away with the axe. Now, I have heard other stories that said that Mayma survives long enough to be taken from the scene and then dies elsewhere. That could be a possibility, especially when we get to talking about the hauntings. But I also saw that they were killed immediately. So I'm not sure exactly which of those is true, but clearly awful. Mayma's daughter tried to run away, but Julian caught her in the courtyard and killed her too. While this was happening, Wright's employees were trying to get away from the fire. Remember, they're in a different room. Right. But they found the windows and doors to be locked. One of the draftsmen, Herbert Fritz, broke a window with his arm and escaped, but he had broken his arm in the process. Emile Brodel was still in the room when Julian came in, and these two, of course, have not liked each other at all. He killed the draftsman with whom he'd had that rivalry. He then waited outside the door and ambushed foreman William Weston and his 13-year-old son, Ernest. Both managed to get away, but Ernest had been mortally wounded and died hours later. Two of the other employees, laborer Thomas Brunker and gardener David Lindblom, managed to fight Julian off. They inhaled a lot of smoke, though, and had been badly burned and succumbed to their injuries days later. Of the nine people in the home, only two survived. The dead were 13-year-old Ernest Weston, draftsman Emile Brodel, gardener David Lindblom, his laborer Thomas Brunker, Mayma Cheney, and her two children, John and Martha. Neighbors ran to put out the fire, while Julian hid in the basement. He attempted suicide by drinking muriatic acid. He was found by a posse who wanted to lynch him on the spot, but they eventually carried him off to jail. Julian never gave a motive for the murders, and he died a while later in jail from starvation because his esophagus was burned so badly by the acid. Gertrude had no idea of Julian's plans and had been dressed and packed for traveling, expecting to catch a train with her husband. She was found out in the field where we imagined she had run to get away from the burning house. She was released and left for Chicago and was never heard from again. Wright arrived home later that evening and was overcome by the horror. He never did recover from the tragedy, and he never did another prairie school design again. Taliesin was rebuilt, and Wright would eventually move back there and bring another companion with him that he would later marry, but she eventually left him. Taliesin would burn again in 1925 and was rebuilt once more. So the one that you can go visit to this day is Taliesin 3, and they actually have the Roman numerals and name it that way. So for nothing else, he is definitely persistent. He continues to rebuild and rebuild. About the second time it burned down, I'd probably be like, man, forget it. I'm done. Yeah, same. Taliesin still holds on to the tragedy. Spirits are restless here. When the bodies were pulled from the fire, they were taken to a cottage on the property, Tanny Dairy. Mayma Cheney's full-bodied apparition wearing white has been seen here both inside and walking around the outside. She sometimes is seen washing clothes, which seems weird since she didn't live in the cottage and she had servants, so we can't imagine she would do the laundry. Doors mysteriously open and close at the cottage. The windows do the same. And she likes to play with the lights as well. Groundskeepers find windows and doors wide open the mornings after they lock up. One visitor arrived at the cottage and found the water running, and no one else was there. He also heard disembodied footsteps. The scent of smoke is sometimes caught on the air as well. 
Frank Lloyd Wright is at unrest as well, and it could be because his body was moved. He was originally buried on this property, but his daughter had him exhumed, cremated, and moved to Talias and West in Arizona. This was against his wishes. To end on a more positive note, we would like to share about a place here in Florida with a strong connection to Frank Lloyd Wright, and that is Florida Southern College. This is the oldest private college in the state and was founded in 1852 as a Methodist seminary. Dr. Lud Spivey took over as the college's president in 1925, and he wanted to do something that would spice up the college and put it on the map. He wanted a campus of tomorrow. What better architect to provide that than Frank Lloyd Wright? Wright visited the campus for the first time in 1938, and over the course of 20 years, he designed 18 buildings for the campus, and 13 of them were built. Many of these buildings were built by the students. This is today one of the 28 Wright projects that are National Historic Landmarks. This location is the greatest concentration of Wright's work on one site for one client. Kelly, the reason why this came to mind to me is the very first time that History Ghost Bump was ever asked to speak in front of a group was here at a local place in Florida. And they said, hey, are there any kind of haunts in this area? It it was Lakeland, Florida, which is about, I'd say, 45 minutes from where we live. So I'm looking up stuff and I see all these ghost stories connected to Florida Southern College. And then when I started reading more about it, I'm like, holy cow, this is like a place that was designed heavily by Frank Lloyd Wright. How amazing. Who would have thought some place down here in Florida would have that kind of a connection, especially a college most people haven't ever heard of before? Yeah, definitely. It's very cool. So when this came up, I'm like, well, this would be a great chance for me to share the stuff that I found when we did that initial presentation. The Annie Pfeiffer Chapel was the first Frank Lloyd Wright designed and built building on the campus. The church was dedicated in 1941 and has been home to both Protestant services and Catholic masses. Inside the chapel, one can see a full organ, baby grand piano, theater-style seating, and an ornate choir screen made from handcrafted interlocking textile blocks. There's one problem, though, with that choir screen. It was not installed correctly, so it kind of leans weird. It's not symmetrical. And you can imagine Frank oh, that Lloyd probably Wright. Made him nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to want it to be symmetrical. Exactly. And it did drive him nuts. Apparently so nuts that even after death, he is haunting the chapel. Rumors have circulated that his apparition has been seen staring over the screen, looking at it, scowling at it, (laughs) that kind of thing. So he's so upset about it, he is not at rest because he wants that darn choir screen fixed. That makes sense. And it's such a popular design that in the store at the college, they sell it on coasters and other things. It's, It's a really cool little design. Yeah, it's it, it's the shapes of it. It's kind of like the best way I could describe it is imagine a bunch of diamonds that are cut into something. Only it's not diamonds. It's a more artistic kind of looking diamond, I guess you could huh. say. And so it's design you might see done on a shirt or something that's sure. a pattern that would be on something. The Buckner Theater was designed by Wright and is a theater in the round. Many students have claimed that the theater is haunted, which is not surprising since most theaters make that claim. Students say that they have seen phantom hands in the curtains and see doors open and close on their own. There was one student who was in the theater alone and claimed to have seen legs walking up on the catwalk. But when he looked more closely, he saw no body above the leg. That would be enough for me. Thanks. (laughs) I would just be enthralled. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, you got the spotlight up there. How are you moving that with your feet? (laughs) Other people who have been in the building say that they have heard disembodied screams and strange music in the air. Lily shared her experience with Backpackerverse.com. I'd been volunteering with the theater group for about a month. I felt like it was very obvious to everyone else on crew that I had no prior experience with sets. Majority of the hours I worked were actually spent correcting mistakes I'd made with various backdrops. Oops. (laughs) And that is precisely what I was doing when I had the most frightening experience of my life. It was late and everyone else had gone home or back to their dorms. I just finished some detailing on a backdrop and I was the only one left at Buckner. The painting was fully finished and I grabbed the supplies to take to the backstage area. I had my arms full of paint cans and brushes when I walked off the stage. As I walked by the curtains, the fabric seemed to move toward me in a swift lunge. It scared the crap out of me, so I began to run towards backstage, whatever it took to put the supplies away and get out of there. Furniture props were scattered everywhere and as I scurried past a chair, numerous hands seemed to reach out and grab at my ankles. I fell and the paints went flying everywhere, but I was beyond caring at that point. I honestly don't even recall driving out of Lakeland that night, and I never went back to work with the drama department again. 
Yeah, I don't know that I'd be available for multiple hands trying to reach out and grab my ankle. <laughs> no. <laughs> Unless I was at a haunted house, like a, a fun fun house type haunted Yeah, house. I've never heard a haunting like that where it's like all of a sudden the curtain starts coming at you and you're just sitting there going, well, maybe your imagination ran away with her a little bit and she thought the curtain was coming at her that way, but then to all of a sudden have your feel like something grabs your ankle and pulls your feet out from under you. Well, and the other thing that I'm I'm thinking is perhaps as she was running past the curtain, that wind, that current kicks up and mm-hmm. ruffles the bottom of it. So maybe if that was brushing up against her. Yeah. And I then don't know. as she's continuing to run, she trips and thinks that. Yeah. Because it's just like I told you when we were doing the uh, ghost tour in Denver and all of a sudden I was on the ground and I was like, what happened? I didn't feel myself trip. Right. And I'm like, we just talked about a ghost that would push people from behind. Did I get pushed or did I trip? And I, to this day, I don't know what happened. I just know I ended up on the ground with a fat lip. Right. Ouch. Thank God no broken teeth. Yeah. <laughs> the Joseph Reynolds Hall, or JR for short, is a female dorm that is one of the original buildings on the campus, built in 1922. It features beautiful chandeliers and white archways and was designed in the colonial revival architectural style. An unidentified writer wrote in the LAL Today paper out of Lakeland on October 24th, 2012, and no ghost post could be complete without a personal testimony. Being a female student at FSC, I lived in Joseph Reynolds Hall my freshman year, and I had my own encounters with our resident ghost, Alan Spivey. Alan was the son of Mr. Spivey, a well-known figure on campus. At a young age, contrary to other stories, he was bitten by a rabid dog causing him to die a slow and painful death. Stories tell that he passed in JR before it became the freshman girls' residence hall. But in truth, that statement is unknown. Regardless, Alan passed and his presence continues to haunt the halls of JR. I lived on the third floor in a room previously used as a storage unit. Upon my roommate and I's arrival, weird things started happening in our room. Our DVD player would turn on and off subtitles randomly, even though my remote was sitting on my desk untouched. No matter what decoration we hung on the wall or what we hung it with, it was only a matter of days before it was torn off the wall without anyone touching it. This happened several times while I was alone. Posters would be thrown at me from across the room where they were hung. He would also walk around our wooden furniture, making creaking footsteps as he moved around. He also liked to bang on our windows as we slept or when we had friends over. But every time we said, Alan, we don't want to play right now, and the subtitles would turn off, posters would stop being torn down, Furniture would stop creaking and the banging on the windows would cease. After, we moved to another room the second semester to trade with a friend who wanted a bigger room. We never heard from Alan again. Coincidence? I think not. Frank Lloyd Wright was an interesting man and a gifted designer. Is his former love, May Ma Cheney, still walking through the property where she met a tragic end? Is Taliesin haunted? Is the campus of Florida Southern University haunted? And does Wright's spirit hang out there in the afterlife? That... Is for, for you, you to, to decide. decide. Well, Kelly, you and I can go check out uh, Florida Southern University and see if we see anything. I definitely want to. They used to do a night tour there where you could see all the different buildings lit up at night and it would show off some of the light Oh, nice stuff that he would do because he was so into light and everything. Right. I don't know if they've started that up yet again or we'll have to wait till after COVID and stuff, but it might be kind of cool to check that stuff out. Definitely put it on our calendar. We want to encourage you guys to check out our website at historyghostbump.com. And if you want to send us some feedback, you can do that at historyghostbump at gmail.com. We got several messages on Instagram. So I first want to thank Brianna for your message. It was very sweet. Thank you. D11874, yours was very sweet as well. Thank you. And then we heard from Natalie. And she wrote, hi, guys, I absolutely love your podcast. And as an Australian, I'm really enjoying your episodes that cover Australian locations. I thought I would recommend a few other haunted locations that are well known here. So the first one that she recommended was the quarantine station in Sydney, which we actually had done many, many moons ago back on episode 17. Oh, wow. So she hadn't gotten a chance to hear that yet. I always suggest to people, if you want to see if we've done something, put the location in along with History Goes Bump podcast and it should pop up in Google. And the reason why she had suggested it is because she said... uh, She's visited and done a ghost tour there, and it was absolutely terrifying. She still can't reconcile what she'd experienced there, but definitely won't go back again. Wow. So it was scary enough that she's like, "Mm." tell me more. (laughs) Guess what? She did. Oh, perfect. So she shares her experience in the caretaker's cottage. There are many guides who refuse to go in there because the spirit that inhabits the cottage can be quite nasty. 
I was on the tour with my best friend and I told her and the guide I didn't want to go in because I had a terrible feeling just looking at the cottage. This guide coaxed me in and walked with me into the cottage and let me walk through the rooms. I go to the back of the cottage to where there's a back bathroom and as soon as I stepped into that bathroom, I started hysterically crying and shaking. I saw the vivid colors of blood on the walls, in the sink, and in the shower. Oh my goodness. Pretty much legged it out of the cottage immediately and once I calmed down, told the guide what I'd seen. The guide said that does happen to some people and they have seen similar things there. They believe that a young girl was brutally attacked in that bathroom by some grave diggers. By grave diggers? That's what she'd said. Wow. By far one of the most terrifying things I have ever experienced. I can imagine. And who wants to see that? I mean, we're talking about you being more sensitive. You would not want to see that, No, Kelly. I certainly would not. We want to thank you guys for tuning in to this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We want to thank Jenny Rains for your donation. It was greatly appreciated. Want to thank Myra Wheeler for upping your donation. Mort is going to be moving you into a garden tomb now. And welcome into the cemetery, Melody Hoschek. You're going to be under a marble headstone. And Cheryl Cadwallader, we're going to be burying you in a chest tomb. Thanks, everyone, for supporting History Goes Bump. We really appreciate it. Fan of the show? Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast catcher. Who was a well-known ast? Who was a well-known astronomer? Astronauter. He was an astronauter. <laughs> at least I didn't call him. You know, just a. a- <laughs> <laughs> hey, now it's child-friendly. Hello, you spectacular listeners. <laughs> listeners, people, whatever. I'll just change it up. We've only been doing the same thing for five and a half years. <laughs> it's so tired and boring. And he was a true architectural visionary. His designs were ahead of their time, and he was a true architectural vision. <laughs> Those are hard to put Vis- together. Architectural visioner. <laughs> architectural visionary. Frank Lloyd Wright was born. Frank? Boing? He was boing. <laughs> I don't even know what that's supposed to be. Boing, 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 boing. Wright would move on to another firm, Adler and Sullivan, where his architectural prowess, prowess, You actually said it right. It sounded weird coming out of my mouth. (laughs) Where his architectural... No, I can't say it. Now you're not going to be able to say it. You said it right the first time. (laughs) I I know I said it right, but it had a weird feeling coming out of my mouth. Where his architectural prowess... Prowess. See, I'm putting an R in there. I think I put an R in there the first time, too. (laughs) Mowage. Not going to recover. Where his architectural... (laughs) maybe i should have picked a different word i wanted to sound smart with that word Uh uh-huh i've got the smarticle particles where his architectural i can't damn it i can't say it now (laughs) gosh darn it where his architectural skills yes there we go where his architectural (laughs) now i can't say architectural where his architectural skills would blossom can you take out the (laughs) pause (laughs) just take the pause out is that fine (laughs) asking for a friend try it one more time (laughs) where his architectural skills would blossom there you go winner winner chicken dinner (laughs) i sound slap happy and it's morning look at you getting all the numbers right kelly i'm (laughs) impressed I know, it's the second time this this episode you've gotten the right number. (laughs)